So just a few days ago from when I'm making this video, once again Earth experienced some of the most beautiful aurora we've seen in years. The result of major eruptions from the Sun and the coronal mass ejection that was produced in early October. And on October 3rd, 2024, the Sun essentially produced this. The most powerful solar flare of this solar cycle measured at X9.05. And although not all solar flares result in coronal mass ejections and thus produce aurora, this one did. As a matter of fact, there is actually a bit of a confusion usually when it comes to differentiating between solar flares and coronal mass ejections. In a nutshell, a solar flare is a really bright flash that usually produces a lot of ultraviolet and even X-ray radiation, which travels at the speed of light and sometimes causes radio blackouts while also affecting the upper atmosphere. In contrast, a coronal mass ejection is basically a burst of particles resulting from a snap of magnetic lines around the Sun which travel much slower and usually take a few days to reach planet Earth. But when they do, they very often cause dramatic shifts in the magnetic lines of planet Earth, with all of these particles following the magnetic lines and then colliding with the atmosphere, producing various visual effects. Which is basically what we call aurora. And that's essentially what many of you might have witnessed last week. And even though this was the most powerful solar flare in the last two decades, here I think we have to be super grateful to our sun. And so, how wonderful person, this is Anton, let's talk about recent discoveries about solar flares, or technically stellar flares, and how ridiculously powerful they seem to be around other stars, and briefly discuss what this means for potential habitability of various planets around those stars. Although here I actually briefly wanted to mention one more thing. So yeah, this was the most powerful recent flare, but the most powerful flare ever seen on the Sun is actually this. This was in 2003 during the Halloween storms, and it was actually an X45 class solar storm, with the letter and the number indicating how strong the flare was. When it comes to flares, there are actually five categories, A, B, C, M, and X, with X being the most powerful. And the number in this case indicates the total amount of energy. So for an X10 class, that's a release of 10 to the power of 32 ergs of energy. And because this flare was X45, it essentially produced 4.5 times more energy. And so for the Sun, this is basically as powerful as it gets. In contrast, in the last few years, researchers have actually been able to identify several super flares coming from various stars out there. And just like a few days ago, one of them was even seen 1600 light years away from us in the star system HD 251108, where a giant star approximately seven times more massive than the Sun, was just observed by the X-ray telescope on top of the International Space Station. This is the NICER telescope, able to detect X-ray emissions from really far away. And while well, compared to the Sun, this emission was ridiculous. Once again, some of the larger flares on the Sun usually produce 10 to the power of 32 ergs. In contrast, this one was at least 100 times more powerful. And this flare was so powerful that its effects on the star were observed even after 10 days. And surprisingly, this is a typical flare for many different stars out there. And so in the last decade, scientists discovered many of these super flares around different types of stars. But there was one star that they actually wanted to learn more about. The M-type star. More commonly known as the Red Dwarf, which essentially represents the most common type of stars in the entire galaxy. But much more importantly, Pretty much most of the terrestrial planets discovered so far are all orbiting red dwarfs. Some of the most exciting ones, including the ones in the habitable zones, all seem to be around M-type stars. And though generally speaking, they're obviously much smaller and much less massive than the Sun and produce much less energy, they seem to be a little bit more dangerous for a lot of planets orbiting in their systems. And that's despite the fact that they actually burn hydrogen really slowly which actually means they can survive for hundreds of billions of years. But it turns out that a lot of recent studies discovered that they also produce super powerful flares. Flares similar to the one we just observed 1600 light years away from us, and flares that we've even seen several times around some of the more famous nearby stars. And that actually includes the Proxima Centauri, the closest star to us. The one that actually does contain a terrestrial planet in the habitable zone. And so over the years, this basically raised the question. So what does this mean for this planet? Does it mean that it actually lacks any chance for habitability? And does it mean that it potentially has 
no atmosphere, and obviously, no chance for liquid water. And so that's essentially what this new paper tries to establish. The study by Vera Berger and her team takes a look at 182 flares from 158 nearby stars, analyzing their ultraviolet emissions. In the process discovering that, yeah, they actually seem to be even more dangerous than we initially thought, with the total energy potentially being miscalculated and the actual energy being even higher. And so in essence here, the researchers focused on approximately a decade worth of observations from telescopes like Galax, examining approximately 300,000 stars and discovering 180 flares that came from red dwarfs. And because previous observations mostly focused on the optical light, here it was actually kind of difficult to establish how much ultraviolet emissions these flares actually produced. And knowing how much UV light was produced is technically super important. And that's because not having any UV light suggests that any planet here could potentially lack the ability to form things like the ozone layer. So basically to form the ozone, we actually need to have some UV in order to break down oxygen molecules and to then produce ozone, which protects the planet from something more dangerous. Likewise, UV light also initiates certain important types of chemistry in the upper atmosphere. For example, the evolution of various proteins and enzymes was most likely the result of ultraviolet radiation and the evolution of certain mechanisms inside DNA. In other words, in order to have a truly habitable planet and to potentially have life on it, you do need to have some UV radiation. But there is a limit. Too much radiation, and too frequently, will actually have the opposite effect. And so by having too many stellar flares, and by producing too much UV radiation, it can actually strip away the atmosphere of the planet in just a few million years. And so this recent study essentially discovered that many previous studies potentially underestimated the amount of UV light produced by various flares. Here we're talking about flares around distant stars. And so 180 flares discovered in this study very likely had at least 100% more emissions compared to previous calculations. And that of course suggests that planets around those stars would be most likely stripped of atmospheres really quickly. Many of these planets would very likely be hostile to life and even incapable of maintaining atmospheres. And that's even for planets in so-called habitable zones. And because in many of these cases these planets are also much much closer to the star, with a typical orbit of just 7 to 10 days, this would also dramatically increase the total amount of radiation received on the surface. And so many of these objects would be basically stripped entirely in under a million years. And that's a really big difference from what was previously discovered approximately 4 years ago. In one of the previous studies, by looking at approximately 1200 flares, researchers only discovered approximately 8% of stars producing powerful enough flares to potentially cause ozone depletion, with only 1% of stars possibly stripping planets of everything on the surface. But here the study suggests otherwise. A lot of these flares were potentially much more powerful, thus producing way more energetic UV light, and the UV light that would not be productive for life and would instead destroy it. In contrast, for our Sun, the UVC radiation is actually perfect for driving prebiotic chemistry while also being responsible for the ozone layer. Which once again implies that our Sun just kind of seems to be perfect. It's essentially in its own Goldilocks zone, where it produces just enough UV light to be extremely useful for life, but not enough UV light and not enough flares to become overly destructive. And that of course means that discovering some kind of a star system that's going to have similar conditions might have just gotten a little bit more difficult. It looks like many stars, especially red dwarfs, potentially produce too many flares, and many of these flares would not be conductive for life and would instead destroy planetary surfaces, leaving no atmosphere and no chance for water to exist. But that's of course just based on observations from those 180 flares. In order to understand how all of this works, and in order to find out if any of the planets out there can potentially have similar conditions to planet Earth, we obviously have to have a much bigger sample. And so in the next few months, or possibly in the next few years, we might discover additional details about star systems like the TRAPPIST-1 system, with its seven terrestrial planets in orbit, that could potentially help us understand if anything can exist there. Right now, based on the observations from the James Webb, we know that the two nearby planets seem to have nothing. They've been stripped entirely of any atmosphere, and so at the moment it doesn't really look good. 
but there are still five planets to go, and so once we get some updates or some new discoveries about those planets, we'll come back and talk more about this in some of the future videos. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.